Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Jessica Bayless, and I oversee the Civic CLP Initiative at Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. And I'd like to welcome you to, I've never thought of it that way, how to have fearlessly curious conversations in dangerously divided times. Today's event is the first of our 2022 Civic CLP speaker series and is supported through generous funding from the Pittsburgh Foundation. This event is being recorded and we will be sharing this with all the registered attendees. And it's also being presented live on our library Facebook page. Hello out there. As you listen to the discussion, you are encouraged to share questions in the Zoom Q&A found at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're tuning in from Facebook land, you can share in the comments and we'll do our best to address those with the time allotted at the end. Finally, a couple community agreements have been written for this virtual event by participating today through our Q&A or in the comments, you are agreeing to the following. Keep it relevant. This discussion is focused on depolarization through curious conversations and deliberate dialogue. Please do your best to tailor your questions and comments to the topics at hand. Keep it kind, treat everybody in the virtual space with respect and keep it positive. Opinions will vary and all opinions are valid. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce John Saruf, co-executive director and director of program development for Essential Partners. John teaches people how to facilitate dialogue across differences, mediate conflict and manage interpersonal as well as intergroup challenges in their lives, communities and workplaces. John has authored curriculum and dialogue guides for schools, documentary films and journalists, as well as public dialogue guides on the op opioid crisis, guns in America, the red blue divide and returning to post pandemic life among others. John also brings 15 years in the theater as a professional actor and director. Welcome, John. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you the person we really come to listen to and learn from today, Monica Guzman is senior fellow for public practice at Braver Angels and author of I Never Thought of It That Way, How to Have Fearlessly Curious Conversations in Dangerously Divided Times. She's co-founder of the Evergrey. She's a former columnist at the Seattle Times, a recent fellow at Harvard's Neiman Foundation for Journal Journalism and the Henry M. Jackson Foundation an immigrant and dual U.S. Mexico citizen and the mom of two bilingual kiddos. Welcome, Monica. So nice to be with you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited for our conversation. I, I had such a fun time reading this book. If, you, if people who are listening have not had a chance to read it, you should get it. It's both informative, but also um, uh, touching and easy to read. Uh, it, it's it just uh, so much life, uh, beautiful writing. So thank you. I want to just get to the why of this for you. I know that there are lots of sort of larger whys in the country, but to, to write a book like this is a big undertaking. Why this book? Why now? Is there a story or an experience that led you to say, this is what I have to do with my life right now? Yeah. There was a moment in 2017 in January, the Seattle Women's March. And I'm a journalist. I don't march in protests. That's not what I do. That day, I ended up making a sign and holding it up anyway, going very much against my typical rules. But the sign didn't have any kind of liberal political slogan. It just had three words on it. It had honesty, curiosity, and respect. And I just felt driven to march for those three things. I was looking around the world as a journalist and as a human. And those were the things I was most worried about losing, not a political fight. Um, as a journalist, 
in my whole career, I take very seriously this mission to help people understand each other. And I thought for ages that the way to do that is to tell people stories and share them into this journalistic landscape. But several years ago, I started to realize it's too fractured for that. Something is broken at the foundation of how we communicate that's making it really hard for understanding to happen no matter what kinds of wonderful stories I tell. It doesn't matter or anyone mm -hmm. else tells. And then there's the personal angle, which is my own family. So I'm a Mexican immigrant. I'm the daughter of Mexican immigrants. And my parents both voted enthusiastically for Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020. And I voted very enthusiastically <laughs> for Clinton and Biden. We have very different politics. We became citizens in the year 2000 and have had rollicking, crazy political conversations ever since. Right. So, you know, we were no strangers to that. But in 2015, with that campaign, stuff started to get a lot more intense. Mm -hmm. The crazy thing was that we were actually able to understand each other. I got to the point where I knew why they had made a very different choice that I really didn't like. And they got to understand why I made a choice they didn't really like. Mm -hmm. And then contrasting that with what was going on with so many families and relationships across the country, which was just bur burning bridges, breaking the relationships, too much pain, too, right. too high stakes. So all of those things kind of led me after that moment in the Women's March to say, I think it's time for me to back away from journalism a bit and, and try to work on the underlying problem. And that led oh, to that. Fantastic. I never even thought about how hard it is to be a journalist in this moment. We talk about how journalism you know, has become bifurcated and, and there's sort of people are watching different things, but to actually try to be the honest, you know, observer and storyteller of what's happening right now is really difficult in that moment. I, I never thought about that. Yeah, I like to think that curiosity is a foundational principle in journalism. And in the last several years, again, journalists have just been wrangling with technology and what it makes possible, what happens when so many people are able to express themselves very powerfully and very easily online. How does that change the way that we arrive at truth? How does that change the stories that feel shared and the ones mm -hmm. that don't? And, uh, you know, we're seeing the impacts. And so now we have to level up, you know, as journalists, but also as people and figure yeah. out how to manage this so that we can still come out on top. Great. So, so let's think about what's happening right now. You've done a lot of thinking about this. We hear a lot about it on the news. I'd love to get your take on, on what's happening right now. In the first three chapters of the book, you're really exploring how we've divided ourselves and the cost of that. We'll talk about the cost in, in just a little bit. You talk about these three elements, sorting, othering, and siloing. So can you just Tell us a little bit about how the what like what's happening right now in this sorting, othering, and si siloing pattern that you're seeing. Yeah, so the the first fifth of the book, part one of five, is all about this. How did we come to be this divided? So the framework I put out around it is the SOS, the call for help. We're sorting, othering, and siloing. The tricky bit is that these are all tendencies in human nature that can be quite good. It's just that they're leading us to a not great place. So sorting is the natural human tendency to want to be around people who are like us. They make us more comfortable. When you add a lot of stress and tension and transformation around the world, that, that we double down on that. The last thing we want is to build new relationships with people who are going to challenge us and stress us out. It's a scary enough time as it is. Then there's othering. Research goes back to mid-century um, about how little meaning there needs to be in our differences for us to discriminate across difference. Mm. So when there is meaning, it gets ugly real fast. We put, so othering is, is the process of putting distance between ourselves and those we deem different. It helps us bond. It helps the us bond to have a them. And then there's siloing. So mostly that's a story of this guy. Uh, it's how we are able to take so much stimulation from our world and curate it so that it comes through the voices that we prefer. That doesn't mean that we only hear one perspective. We do hear other perspectives, but usually those are filtered through the voices we prefer. So there's layers of judgment added on top of those before they are received by us. So what happens is that it starts to become 
you know, people call it an echo chamber. I call it a silo, uh, like an old, old ancient silo that used to be dug into the ground where you can't even see what's out there anymore. You know, the world is sort of being echoed back to you in, in this particular way. And all of this adds up the SOS to my conclusion that we're so divided, we're blinded. That one of the major downsides of all of this is that we cannot see the world for what it truly is. We cannot see other people's perspectives for what they truly are. So what are we going to do about it? Oh, I love it. But before we get to the what we're going to do about it, because there's so much wonderful stuff in the book about that, I, I want to focus in on uh, this, this idea of siloing. One, you, you do a wonderful uh, thing in this book. You take some responsibility for it. I mean, I think there's a lot of thinking, um, you know, about how forces have made us siloed. And you talk about that too, but you you explain in this book that you've created your own silo in some ways, you know, that, that that's something that, that initiated from you. Could you say a little bit more about how that works and how it impacts you? Yeah, um, there's a couple spots where I talk about this. So, so of course, correct me if I'm not getting to the particular chunk okay. that you're thinking of. But, uh, but one of the places where this really hit home for me was years ago. I was coming home from work in Seattle, and I was doing what I always did, which was look at my phone, just Twitter, and and I got home and I, you know, kept kind of looking at my phone and. People were talking about what a gorgeous sunset we'd had that night, just absolutely beautiful. And um, so I was kind of liking those photos saying like, oh gosh, darn it, like I wish I'd seen it. And then I realized, well, you could have seen it. It was, right. you, you, you walked home and then you got on the bus. You could have just looked out the window <laughs> to yeah. see it. Yeah. So it was, it was this aha moment about how the worlds we create end up sort of beating the world that's around us. It's more relevant. We've right. we've designed it that way. It's more right. personal. We've designed it that way. So we remove ourselves from the spontaneity of interactions that might surprise us or even mm -hmm. just the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, beautiful story. And it and it, it it sounds like you're saying, and this has certainly been our experience in the work that we do, that the more tense and the more sort of toxic this polarization gets the more we actually feel the need to retreat to our to our safe places right and not bridge and it actually feels dangerous to bridge or to go outside of our own silo because we might actually be sort of kicked out you know that if if we begin to 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 do that reaching out it's it feels dangerous yeah absolutely there there's so many fears that yeah. come up in a time like this and like you said again it it it's worthwhile to see why we do what we do and how there are very good reasons. <laughs> and right. and yeah, when we are scared, we want to go where we're comfortable. And we've spent all this time, you know, when you're bored, when you're waiting for the bus, when you're waiting in line for coffee, whatever you're doing, it's like you pull out the phone. This has become right. a familiar home base, right? So yeah, when the world is a pretty scary place, you know, you just want to distract yourself or whatever, you're gonna you're gonna jump back into that. Um right. We do have a lot of fear that if we talk to people who disagrees disagree with us, if we listen to their story, we validate their conclusions. That's uh. one very, very big fear. There's another one that if there's any witnesses to our bridging, then we're, we better explain ourselves. Why are we even associating with the other side? What what will that do to our status? Um, again, in, in times of fear and stress, we, we want to be where we're comfortable. We also really need to belong. So the idea of people who agree with us judging and wondering if we're betraying them really, really grates on us. And we don't want to take that on. Um, right. And then, of course, there's the question of the, the psychological difficulty of bridging to begin with. Like, we don't want to add more difficulty to our lives. And it's, it feels, depending on what you're imagining, it feels really, really, really hard. Um, right. But interestingly enough, what I've noticed is that when people ask me about this, they imagine the worst. You know, mm -hmm. they speak about bridging as if I'm going to I'm going to talk to a Nazi. Like, right. do you know a Nazi? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know that it's going to be that bad that quick, but it goes to yeah. show how afraid we are. We imagine the worst. Right. Right, right. Um, so I want to go back and just pick up on what you said earlier about this fear of if I listen, it feels like I'm acknowledging or agreeing or, or I, I'm somehow betraying my side and, and saying it's okay. 
what um say more about that and how how can we listen and we're going to get more into this later but because you brought it up now i want to mm. i want to explore it a little bit how do you listen to somebody say something so different than you and and be with them witness them listen deeply or whatever whatever without sort of feeling like you're betraying what, what is that mm. yeah it's there's a lot of dimensions to it i think one of the core mindset shifts to make is that you're not engaging an idea, you're engaging a person. Mm. And a person is always valid. Um, I, I like to say, there's always truth in people's stories, even when there's no truth in their conclusions. Oh, interesting. So we get to this place where we think, and I'm, and I'm quoting someone who did a TED talk about this, but empathy is not endorsement. And mm. I've, I've practiced that for years. I mean, journalists, I've talked to some people who've done some pretty bad things, including a convicted murderer uh, who I, I watched be executed in the state of Texas. I did not think that by listening to his story, I was somehow endorsing his crime. I, I right. my, my job is to, is to understand and try to communicate to the rest of society, right? So anyway, so that idea that, that when we witness, we end up endorsing is, is a tough one. So how, how do you listen? It does begin with that, that idea of there's a valid person there, right? So people talk about, for example, what happens when someone just says something I know to be untrue? It's just mm -hmm. wrong. It's just not true. I know right. it, right? And we we think of that as sort of abort, abort. Like there's nothing to do. Either you correct that person and hope that they acknowledge you. And if they don't, then you're done or what? Like you just walk away. But, and I'll borrow a framework from my friend, Buster Benson, who wrote a book called Why Are We Yelling? That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how there's three kind of types of uh, conversations across disagreement you can have. The conversation about what is true, the conversation about what is meaningful, and the conversation about what is useful. So when you when you come to that clash on facts, on the conversation than what is true, come back to the conversation about what is meaningful. The great thing about the conversations about what is meaningful is everyone is qualified to have them because we are all experts on our own story. We're all experts on how we find meaning in our world and in the events of the world. So that's it. You can ask questions about how people came to their beliefs instead of asking them to justify why they believe what they believe. You can ask about their concerns um, instead of sort of, I don't know, getting to kind of uh, opinion versus opinion showdowns. And there's lots of other things, but, but it begins with that, that you are speaking to a valid person and that's okay. It, get back, it gets back to some level of dignity that everybody feel. It, it feels like if, if, if we can afford at least a baseline of dignity to people that we can yeah. uh, assume that he, uh, our fellow human beings deserve that, then it's a it's a place to to step from. Yeah, exactly. And we get lost to I think that the ethic and aesthetic of the internet has made us conflate opinion with identity. And right. we don't do ourselves any favors. I see a lot of people on Twitter. You know, here's my name on Twitter, and then dash here's my cause. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it makes it pretty uh, tough to open up a dialogue sometimes. Right, absolutely. But let's talk a little bit about the cost of the moment. What are we losing? I mean, why should it matter what's happening in our country right now? What are you seeing as the cost to all this sorting, othering, and siloing? I mean, there's lots. One of the things I see is at the level of policy, extraordinarily reactionary policy. Uh, one of the things we're seeing on, on the political scale is nationally, there's so much um, dysfunction that states are often the ones these days fighting the wars, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll do it by making really quick laws to try to stop the other side. We're, we're seeing this on education policy and a bunch of other ways. And it's very reckless because it's, it's, it's trying to put a stop sign in front of someone you don't even understand. You haven't even really been able to have the conversation about what this is really all about anyway. And going up a level, that gets to, we're so divided, we're blinded. Part of the consequence is we don't even really know what our debates are about. We talk about them in the headlines and sort of partisan media blows them up into being these like good versus evil things, but they're not. They never really were. And if you're able to sit down, you'll see that there are valid concerns to deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, they may not be the most savory. They may open up some really tough, ugly things. It could be, but there's still conversations we have to have. And so because we're not having them, 
we just skip over all of that to a lot of vilification. Another huge consequence is, frankly, our national level of stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most incredible things that happens when you start approaching human beings who disagree with you and start to talk is nine times out of 10, I'd say 99 times out of 100, you actually start to relax a little bit. Like some of the threat level goes down. And part of the reason why is we see all this research that shows that when you ask one side to estimate the beliefs on the other, we rampantly exaggerate. This happens on both sides. Rampantly exaggerate the extremity of the views. In other words, we're walking around believing a lie that the views are that bad, that the views are that extreme. They're actually not. So if we're going to walk around with those misperceptions, imagine everything that's going to cause. It's going to cause us to be more afraid. And when you're afraid, you're not creative. Um, it's going to cause us to be more stressed out. And when you're stressed out, you're not going to want to take a risk. So it's it, I, I talk in the book about this kind of polarization is the problem that eats all other problems. It makes every other problem worse. The good news, though, is that I think we can begin to undo it at the level of the one-to-one -one conversation, at the level of the kitchen table, our daily lives. This is where we change. Mm, I love it. I, it also occurs, and I, again, experience this all the time, that if I, if I think that way about the other, I also imagine other people think that way about me, right? And so then I go through my day feeling misunderstood and like I just don't somehow belong in my community. And that level of disconnect feels really um, both disheartening, but I think makes it difficult, as you said, to collaborate and, and to be uh, f fully par uh, participating in your community. Exactly. Because th think of all the human capital, you know, to right. use that technical term, but think of all the human capital we're not deploying because we think everybody hates us or we think that right. nobody's agreeing anywhere at all on anything. And it's just not true. So there's a lot of collaboration that could happen. You look at how, how extraordinary our technology is and our capacity and our level of education and everything we've learned. And then you look at our actual social, socio-political output. It's abysmal, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's about kind of closing that gap. Like our output should be at 100% and it's at like two because of all this yeah. gunk. Like we got to clear that gunk. Right. Yeah, yeah, and that, and and when people are working from, as you said, this this level of threat, this in, you know intense level of threat, they're looking for the slight, they're looking for exactly. the 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 insult. They're coded to be actually in a in a place of vigilance in some way, right. um, which which makes all those interactions even more fraught. Exactly. It's sort of a tragedy of, of the human brain that when we don't know something, we don't just walk around like a good robot, going like. Well, that's a blank in my brain. I don't know why these people do what they do. So I'm just going to not know, right? We don't do that. We fill in the blanks. Yeah. We make assumptions based on signals and hints we get that we don't check. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're walking around with all these projections and those are getting in the way of our being open and curious. I love it. One of the uh, things that you talk about, uh, one of the costs is, it, when we're stuck in our own silos is that we actually stop thinking, we stop learning. And we stop challenging our own ideas. Say a little bit more about that. That that uh, it's it sort of surprised me in a way um, because I hadn't thought of it that way. But the idea that that when I'm stuck in my own bubble, I actually stop learning new things. Say more about that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's many places to go here, but one that comes to mind now is we start to um, we start to play out scenarios all the way to the end, even though mm. we don't see any of that. So. For example, on social media, sometimes people will say, um, you know, an example from the last couple of years, you know, people will say, I, I can't believe this looting of businesses downtown, you know, the violence and protests, this is terrible, this is horrible. Right? And, and what you'll see is that sometimes that comment, you know, is tied with an idea that, well, the protests are no good. Like the protests around racial justice were no good, you know, to take a liberal perspective. And then sometimes people who might believe that the protests for racial justice were just not productive and no good. I mean, sometimes they may really just really, really dislike the entire movement. And then, okay, and some of the people who might like the entire movement, maybe they really believe in racial superiority, right? Like it'll be each, each one of those steps is like a smaller and smaller percentage of people who would actually believe that. But what we do is what I call chaining, where you see that first thing, like the I lament the looting of businesses downtown. And you just assume that the person who's saying that really means 
I'm racist. (laughs) And so, so, so within our silos, we, we hear about how those points are threaded together so often that we start to think it's, we can just be certain that that's what's really lurking in the hearts of these people. And the way we stop thinking is we stop, we stop looking for alternatives. We stop asking, tell me about that. We stop considering you know, it's probably not great to be really violent at protests, <laughs> you know, in the case of very partisan folks on the left, right? You know, yeah, th- there's nuance to so much that gets lost and we stop being able to, to take those points into consideration. Again, because there's some platforms where we see people act in bad faith, you know, and then those examples get blown up to where they seem to be what everyone is doing and they're not. Right, right. You tell a story uh, in here um, from... John A. Powell, who I know is uh, sort of a hero of yours, certainly is of mine, and he he talks about his response to the pastor um, who mm. who asks if she if if uh, he should build bridges with the devil. I mean, it, it sounds like you're you're saying that there's a natural chain of our thinking that goes mm. straight to that most extreme place. Say more right. about that. Absolutely. I, I brought this up earlier in the case of when we imagine, when those of us who are really hesitant to have these kinds of conversations, when we imagine the conversation, we imagine the worst. I'm going to right. encounter an evil, terrible person, right? right? But, but yeah, so there's the projected bridging to the devil. Uh, what John says in the story is that a pastor you know, approached him and said, John, really, you're asking me to bridge with the devil. And John says, maybe don't start there. <laughs> and, I and I love it because his point is there's long bridges and there's short bridges. And so make short bridges, meaning talk to someone you agree with on most things, but you know that you disagree on this one thing and have that conversation. right? And then, and then, okay, maybe somebody who really disagrees in a big way with you and have that conversation. Each of those conversations most more than likely are going to show you something the human and complex that you maybe mm-hmm. hadn't considered before. And then what he says, and this is the magic moment, he's like, after a while of building a lot of short bridges, you may ask yourself, who are you calling the devil? Mm-hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. I love it. Thank you. Um, so I'm, we're, we're sort of moving into some of these solutions that you give uh, um, so much uh, life to in this book. And one of the things that excited me and and uh, surprised me a little bit was when it says uh, i think it's on page 30 you see this is a quote the way to tame othering isn't to turn down the complexity of what divides us we can't pretend we're all the same when we're not or pretend we all agree when we don't it's to turn up the complexity of makes us of what makes us who we are so it sounds like you're actually saying lean into your differences rather than shy away from them. Make things more complex rather than less. It's I, I it's um it's exciting to me to hear that because it's sort of uh, the opposite of what sometimes I I think I okay let's just let's ignore our differences let's not talk yeah. about it or let's yeah. make this simpler say more about complexity and sort of leaning into our differences. Yeah, uh, embracing complexity, I talk about being one of the the key steps to curiosity. You you have to not think that just because something is complicated, that it's therefore confusing, that it's therefore unpleasant, and it's therefore you just want to run away. Complexity means, all right, time to ask your questions. Where do we begin, right? Let's let's unpack this. And what I mean by, you know, turn up the complexity of, of who we are is, there's so much more to talk about than just our conflicting opinions. Mm -hmm. We tend to think that that's the only conversation we can have. You know, I give you my reasons for my opinions. You give me your reasons for your opinions. Sometimes we get a little crazy and we start to think, here's my glittering reason. Look at it, it's so beautiful. It did this incredible thing for me. It convinced me. All I have to do is hand it to you. It will convince you. And then it doesn't convince you and I'm mad. And then, you know, <laughs> so we start, you can tell you're in this terrible loop in, in a conversation because when you start repeating yourself, when you start repeating yeah. your reasons and and that, except you repeat it, but each time angrier. <laughs> you know? and that's, yeah. Yeah. So like, we're not making anything more complex. We're not complicating anything. One of the great ways to make it complicated is look behind the opinion to how people arrived at the opinion, ask them about their personal experiences, and then start to tell each other some stories. And research shows us that when we become storytellers, there's points of connection that go far beyond logic, right? Right. There's points of connection and belonging and 
you know, if I, if I relate to your struggle, you know, on a key decision point where some values were put into tension for you, man, I can really empathize with how you took a different path that led to a different political decision. So mm -hmm. it's that it's turn up the complexity, tell the story instead of the it's just like a grain on your head, right? What's the whole person? Right. And um, it'll really add a lot of color. Um, it'll add a lot of color to the conversation and a mm -hmm. lot of discovery. Mm, I love it. And, and I, I, it also occurs that uh, bringing our own complexity to the story, which isn't doesn't always feel safe, right? I mean, you've got to create enough safety in that conversation to be able to say, you know what, I feel a little bit torn on this too. Or, you know, I, I feel this way most of the time or very strongly this way. But there are times when I worry about dot, 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 right? Exactly. To bring to, to increase your own sense of the complexity of your own feelings. Exactly. And our politics tends to be so binary you know you either vote yeah. for this one or that one that right. that it sort of feels like well then all of all of it should be this way i think we saw this after uh, the roe v wade reversal with the renewed conversation about abortion and all these polls that showed that despite appearances to the contrary most people's beliefs about abortion are very nuanced it's yeah. conditional on the situation and so to look at it as someone's completely for or completely against is just not even true. So, it, you know, to not get there in a conversation, to not start to explore the parameters, you know, ask questions like, well, at what point would this become something that you would not support, right? Mm -hmm. I turned up this or we did that. Start to kind of explore that because otherwise you're going to walk around with your own assumptions, which may be right. completely false about what this other person's beliefs actually amount to. Yeah. And, but it seems like you've got to create the right space for that. If you're in a negotiation on the policy and you feel like you're giving any inch, right? If you, and you say, yeah. well, it's up to here, I might, right? There's a, there's a tendency not to want to give an inch, but if it becomes a, a different kind of conversation, a dialogue where we're really trying to understand each other and ourselves, then you're making space for the moment when you can say, yeah, I, I do see this this space where I, I feel less certain about my opinion or or I begin to, you know, worry that this other value should come in. Yeah. And it helps to call that out in a conversation. One of the ways that you can make the context of this. And and I, I work at Braver Angels, which is a right. nonprofit, the largest that uh, works on depolarizing America, the largest grassroots one. And um, it's it's it can really help to say, hey, I'm really you know, I'm curious and I want to understand this difference between us. Can we have a conversation about it? Get that buy-in. And so then it's sort of, that's the framework because we tend to want to skip to judgment, but mm -hmm. judgment without understanding is reckless. Right. What are you judging? You don't even know what you're judging. You can't even really yes. see it. You're judging the ghost in your head. Yes. Yes. So the first thing to do is close that gap between your imagination and your reality. Um, mm. I, I say in the book, and, and, and I think that this is so, this is like in my head all the time that whoever is underrepresented in your life will be overrepresented in your imagination. Oh, I love so, it. So job number one <laughs> is don't, don't argue with your projections. Yeah. Like argue with what's really there, which means right. you have to take the time to understand what's really there. Right. And hopefully in a context where that person is motivated to understand where you really are. Otherwise the debate you're having is just <laughs> like what's more. Right. More, right. You know? right. It also sounds like a call to go out and seek more diverse relationships. You know, the people yeah. who, you know, represent other parts of the world, because as you say, that will uh, help us understand the world in a, in a much more complex way. I love that. I want to go back. You said something earlier and you sort of touched on it again, just here. Um, this sort of the narrowing of the of the topic that we're arguing about and how we don't even necessarily understand the fullness of it. I think I think about the all the arguments and debates that are going on about uh, critical race theory in schools mm -hmm. being one of these sort of a proxy for a whole set of other questions yeah. that really need to be asked. We're yeah. arguing about this thing that I'm not sure that I'd be able to fully define anyway. And I think this is the case for a lot of people mm -hmm. when what we really need to be asking or what we want to be talking about is what's important in our history, mm -hmm. um, who gets to decide what our kids learn in schools and what's exactly. the role and relationship between parents and educators in the in the design of curriculum and mm -hmm. and and how do we how do we partner 
as uh, co-educators of children? I mean, there's all these wonderful questions that we could be asking that we're not exactly. asking we're not. because we're stuck in this thin right. little uh, sort of representation of our, our identities and and um, yeah. what it, you know uh, something something really uh, abstract rather than what's real for us. That's such a good point. I'm so glad you brought that up because I hear about that a lot. You know, critical race theory, and I think you and I probably both recognize even that term as one that has become so loaded yeah. with with sparky meaning for people that when they come together and talk about something in that universe, they almost never check to see what they even mean by it. Right. Um. And and kind of define those terms. And, and again, they're sort of arguing their projection of this yep. thing. This person supports or does not support teaching critical race theory. And here's what that means for me. I'm not going to say what it means for me to right. just make sure we're on the same page. So, so yeah, these are all proxies. So much of the content, the actual details of our arguments aren't as significant as precisely what you said. The, the, the questions underneath are more about values put into tension with each other. Right. Right. Those are excellent questions. But if we don't even have that debate, if we don't even realize that's the debate that matters, all we're going to do is dig ourselves deeper trenches and lob more fireballs at the other side, which is going to make the real debate when we eventually figure out that that's what we should have that much yeah. harder to engage in. Yeah. So one of your big solutions, I mean, really what you spend a lot of time with the book on is curiosity. Uh, and and the idea of leaning into our curiosity. Say more about how curiosity, you know, is the answer for you, and then we can unpack it and go deeper into the different yeah. parts and how we do that. Yeah, I mean the the controversial thing that I'm always afraid to say is like curiosity makes this fun. I swear <laughs> it really does. I know it sounds like how can you make this fun, and it's like well, no, not all of it, not every moment, right? But there's been research into. Um, conversations across disagreement and when people do enjoy them or get the most out of them there's there's positive they have to be a mix of positive moments and light moments you know mm -hmm. we know that humor breaking the tension with laughter can help um right. and we know that yeah moments of connection and finding something in common can help so curiosity is a wonderful tool for this it's basically it's this mental superpower we all have we don't usually think about but mm -hmm. what it is is this craving for knowledge that gets activated anytime that we become attentive to a gap between what we know and what we want to know. And it can be as silly as sitting around with friends and somebody going, oh, it's that guy in that movie. Do you remember that guy in that movie? And everyone's like, and someone has to pull out their phone and look it up. You yeah. know, it's like, it's just, ah, you got to find out. It can also be unpleasant. Like, when are they going to remove these mask mandates? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm tired mm -hmm. of it. And like, I'm checking my, my news sources every single day, 20 times a day to find updates on this. And I can't, I can't get enough information because there's a hole I have to fill with right. this answer and I don't know how. But either way, curiosity can just it can just impulse drive like our behavior. It's incredible. Um, but you do have to be attentive to that gap between what you know and what you want to know. So the reason it's so powerful here is because there's judgment and there's curiosity. And you they're actually two different modes. When you are judgmental, you cannot be curious because you're judging something, you've already decided something, you already have a bit of certainty. When you're curious, you can't be certain. And so you're discovering, you're exploring, you're pausing, you're considering, and you're gathering more information. So, so those are the steps in curiosity. You gather knowledge, you look for the gaps, what, what is not clear, what do you need to know more about? You ask a question so that you can pull out more information from the other person. What led you to this? Tell me more about that. Give me an example. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. And those sorts of questions are the things that add complexity to these opinion versus opinion showdowns that tend to go nowhere. Mm. Oh, I love it. Uh, and one of the things you talk about in the book that I that I really loved, and it's a term that I'm I'm going to have with me. Um, you, you know, it really is the beginning of curiosity is knowing the limits of your own knowledge. Mm -hmm. You share a phrase, uh, it comes from the old Scottish sailors who talked about the limits of what they could see right. uh, as they were looking out and they say, it's beyond my ken, it's beyond my knowing. Mm -hmm. and I, I just love the phrase and it's really, it indicates that sort of a kind of humility or a kind of understanding of our own limitations is the beginning of curiosity because it, it says, there's a horizon out there I, I want to know something more about. And I'm willing to say, I don't know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so much humility, you know, we think is weakness, which is so yeah. backwards. It's so wrong. Right, <laughs> you know? right. But but yeah, this lovely Scottish word that is still slightly alive of Ken, 
comes from navigation and you can see something like three miles you know to the horizon in the middle of the sea but 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 i kind of tie it into this we walk our own path through the world and there's a lot of things that we know from experience that we have deep expertise in but most things we don't right. not because we're dumb but because right. we walk our own path through the world and we can't walk more than one we can read about others right but then we have to ask questions about the filters and all of that yeah. we still right. don't know it the, the way we know our own story. So that should make all of us humble and, and, and remind us that everyone has their own path through the world. And that path illuminates part of this beautiful map of all our society that could be really cool to take a look mm -hmm. at. And mm -hmm. the best way to take a look at it is to engage that person because they're the only experts on that path. They were there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this sort of leads to the title of your book, which is another step in the sort of curiosity moment, which is the, I never thought of it that way. Uh, you call them uh, in, intuit moments. Um, and, and it seems to be that you're describing somehow a kind of curiosity about yourself. It, it, am I reading that right? That there's a moment when you sort of say, huh, I never thought about it that way is in some ways an internal curiosity. Yeah. And I can't believe, believe it or not, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> I wrote the book on this and I didn't ever look at it that way, but you're exactly right. It is. It's it's turning your radar inward. So very often, and we have this in our language going back centuries, it dawned on me, something mm. clicked, you know, that hit me. We, we already describe a sort of physical sensation of a new insight landing in our brains and making a dent somehow. What's really interesting is we don't know what's going to happen. I think of it as sort of some idea planted a seed. We go, oh, you know, an aha moment. Ah, <laughs> something plants a seed. It could get dug out of the ground tomorrow. We may not even notice it for a week. It could completely change our lives. In the book, I tell stories of people for whom it completely changed their lives. But but these moments and naming them and explaining them is a way of um, increasing our awareness of them. I actually journaled for months every day what my right. I never thought of it that way moments were so that I could track what is going on in my brain. Mm -hmm. And and part of the ethic behind this is um, an aha moment I had researching this book, which was learning from a wonderful uh, ethicist and philosopher, this idea that we don't actually choose our opinions. We don't mm -hmm. choose our opinions. We think we do, you know, that I should be able to just talk you out of some opinion that matters to you really quickly, but that doesn't make any sense. Mm. Our opinions are in a lot of ways the result of the path we've walked through the world. And that's a long and deep path with a lot mm. of roots to it. There's so much in it. It's not just logic and reason, but intuition, you know, shaped almost invisibly. So it's extremely hard to talk people out of their opinion in the course of one conversation. Right. And and yeah, and and all these I never thought of it that way moments have have shaped things in our mind. For all we know, you know, there's a belief we hold that there's an experience in our biography that keeps us clinging to it mm -hmm. beyond logic. Mm -hmm. Do we know mm -hmm. what those are? Are mm -hmm. we bold enough to take a look at them? You know, so yeah, it's it's just it's it's trying to be aware of that, mm -hmm. um, of how all these things evolve in our minds beyond our control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't I don't want to leave us feeling in that that we can't do something about it because you are right. saying at the same time that there is something you can do about it, right? That it's not like I'm I've uh, everything's controlling me. There are some choices we can make now, right? And it sounds like one of the choices that we are asking us to make is this kind of curiosity, both of the other and of self. Yeah, and, and there's a story that comes to mind here that that speaks to that, it's precisely that dimension. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, in Washington State, many years ago, there was a war protest, uh, and they had the war protesters on one side and a big counter protest on the other. And someone from one side was staring at the sign that a woman was holding on the other and decided, I'm going to go and ask her questions. I'm actually curious. So that, that man sat with that woman, started asking her questions. She had not really been asked before. And so they talk and talk and talk, and eventually... The woman puts down her sign and goes home. Mm -hmm. And she tells the man the reason she's going home is because she just realized she has no reason to be there. So in other words, the, the invitation to explore her own perspective made her realize, I don't actually have a reason to be here. There were weird things that led me here, but, but not actually what I want. 
you know, when I was asked about my values and and this particular belief that I have in this, it just didn't add up once I thought about it. So this is another gift that curiosity can give us when we turn it inward and outward. We have our values and sometimes our beliefs and our actions go against our values and we don't even notice. So, so we, it's good to go back and check what is happening sort of organically in our minds and think about it. Is it the right justification that we want? Is it defensible? And this is another wonderful thing that happens when we engage each other. We add that friction and that test. Mm-hmm. But it's uncomfortable too. I mean, you can. I I love that you said that this is this can be fun because I I experience it as mm-hmm. fun and I see people who are engaging in dialogue having a lot of fun, partially because they feel like they're being known and they they're getting to explain things yeah. about themselves that it hadn't, but also because of these aha moments, they're learning, they're growing. And I think that is fun to learn, but it's yeah. scary too, right? I mean, you, there's a moment at which that, mm-hmm. that where you're discovering something that you thought isn't what you thought, or mm-hmm. that you're not as sure as you thought you were, yeah. There can be something scary and disconcerting about that too. Absolutely. And most of the time, I mean, this has happened to me a lot of times where I start to get that kind of shameful sensation when, right. when I've realized, Ooh, oh, shoot, this person might be onto something and I, I might actually have to, damn it, I might be wrong about this. It's extremely hard to be open about that in the course of that conversation. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, realize it later and then edit yourself for the next conversation and evolve your your thoughts. There was a time that I I made a phone call to my colleague at Braver Angels. Mm-hmm. She and I had participated in a Braver Angels podcast where we talked uh, uh, across our differences on abortion, and she had asked a question that pointed out a contradiction in my beliefs about abortion Mm. that I hadn't taken a good hard look at. And then I was just driving in my car somewhere and all of a sudden, like just without really thinking about it, I realized I've just changed my mind on that one piece. And so I was like, uh, and I thought I'm gonna call her and tell her. Mm -hmm. And I did, Mm -hmm. I called her and I said, that question you asked, I just wanna tell you that I've now changed that. And she like almost crashed. She was like, I'm near tears. <laughs> like no, nobody usually says this, right? Like, but but yeah, something somebody said years ago may have had an impact on you. And and we don't tell each other about those moments, so we don't recognize their power. Right. And it sounds like in some ways, too, that instead of losing something in that moment, the getting more complex, getting more introspective actually gets you closer to who you really are. Exactly. rather than the woman holding the sign that actually isn't who she is that right. this that this process is about becoming more who you really are yeah and i bet she would say she would agree she would say well i i i now feel more comfortable right. <laughs> having right. gone through the exploration and like that's i i wanted to be who i am yes it's it gets you closer to who you are i think too that it gets us closer to truth the more friction mm-hmm. we allow you know, the more awareness we have internally and externally, the more curiosity we apply to our world, it, it gets us to see where those things that seem so black and white never were, mm-hmm. you know? And if we continue mm-hmm. to see them as black and white, we're going to live in a scarier world than we need to. Right, right, right. I, I've, uh, we're at Essential Partners, we've done a lot of dialogues around guns, and I had an experience with somebody who talked about, um, you know, uh, having been a, a very uh, serious advocate for uh, more gun control and gun safety and going on marches. And then uh, after having been through these dialogues, she was still deeply committed. But when she went to make some of the signs that they were making in advance of, she looked at all of the signs that really did other people and mm. diminish, you know, who other people were on the other side, right. you know, calling them names that and dehumanizing names. She said, I just can't do that anymore. You know, I, I, I can't, I cannot have that be the way we're representing. So even wow. when you still strongly believe that thing that you do, the, the way you approach it, the way you approach the other in that situation by not dehumanizing can really make exactly. a real difference. Oh, I love that. That reminds me of um, a Braver Angels member in Tennessee. There were some really contentious school board meetings about yeah. mask policies for kids. Yeah. And she was invited as a doctor to give like a scientific, you know, 
um, speech, like in favor of, of the mask mandates, but she was curious and she wanted to make sure that she spoke to somebody who was against those mandates to check her instincts. And so she did, she, she, she met for coffee and an activist against mask mandates who was very conservative and they talked. And what Beth discovered is that in her speech, she, she thought she was being really nice and generous, but she was, she made the whole argument around like, we have to care for each other, you know, let's care for each other as a community. And after talking with the activist, she realized how condescending of me to assume that the other side doesn't care for its community. Mm. What a condescending place to start. Yeah. And so she edited that speech to take that out yeah. because that is, yeah. that is, we don't realize we're doing it, but we push other people away when we assume that they have bad intentions. Right, it's like, right. do we know that? Or that because they oppose what we support, they must hate what we love. Mm -hmm. They hate mm -hmm. our community. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. really? <laughs> Does yeah. that make yeah. any sense? Right. And that's the place we're in in this country when people really think that people on the other side uh, hate the country, hate us, or, you know, it's a, yeah. that are, that's really problematic. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. You talked about it earlier and you write about it in the book. You and your parents, uh, yeah. you, you know, you, you're the daughter of Mexican immigrants who voted for Trump. You're a liberal Seattleite, if that's mm -hmm. the way it's pronounced. Yep. How do you do it? How's it going with your folks right now? <laughs> Things haven't gotten any easier. and It's not going to get easy, any easier as we go into no. uh, election season, which really ramps up the us versus them rhetoric because we just don't have a lot of, uh, I mean, that's the, that's the way the the system is created. There's a mm -hmm. there's an us versus them moment. So tell me what's what's going on for you in your own life, in your family, your relationships. How is how's it going? Yeah. I mean, the relationship's going great. That's been that's been the real power horse, like underneath it all. It's been a little yeah. tough too, because this is a book not about relationships. It's a book about curiosity, but it's right. hard to it's hard to not acknowledge that a strong relationship makes curiosity and trust a lot more possible, right? And it takes a completely it takes a different set of skills and, and, and history. Um, but they are intertwined. Anyway, um I mean it's going well. Uh it's going overall well, but man are the conversations still tough. They really yeah. are tough. Um I was doing book tour stops in DC and they drove up from North Carolina. They now live in North Carolina um to hang out and there was one night in the hotel where me and my mom just like unpacked so much um around all kinds of things like race and and same-sex marriage and all all kinds of stuff and gender. And, you know, and there were really uncomfortable moments that sort of left me with, oh my gosh, that's such a big difference. Like, what do we do? Mm -hmm. The one conversation that, and I think, I think my mom knows this, that I don't think we've had yet that I really want to have with them is about January 6th. Um, we've kind of danced around it, like touched on it, but the, the kinds of, the kinds of things that I feel about it haven't, I haven't really shared deeply with them just yet. Like they could probably guess, um, and I really don't know. I keep sort of falling into the trap of assuming I know what they would say. And I keep going, no, you don't. No, right. you don't. You've got to right. talk to them. Right. Yeah. And then the other big sticking point for us is Trump as a candidate. And so I've talked to my mom and like been curious with my dad, like, so what do you guys think? 2024? Like, what's up? And, <laughs> and they have some curiosity about some of the other candidates, but they're still, you know, pretty supportive of Trump. You know, so me and my husband will like laugh in front of them and say like, well, you know that our jobs are to try to get you to not vote for you. Know, that's just our, it, we are able to make it a little bit funny, mm -hmm. you know, like at least on some moments, but we know it's serious. We right. know at the, at the, at the end of the day, it's very serious, but that's the thing is like my parents spent three weeks with us this summer and somehow the right opportunity for that deeper conversation about January 6th didn't come up. Like, I don't even believe myself as I say that, but it's, right. it can take so much. It can take such of the right moment in the right context. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can tell I'm, I'm working my way up to it. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to know, do you have a go-to thing when you're in this, in a, in a stuck moment or in a really difficult moment? We, we, I do an exercise called, um, keep a question in your pocket. Like we, we go through a whole exercise of thinking about this a tough conversation you you have had or are going to have, and trying to stay curious. Like what's a what's a question that you can keep in your pocket that you know you know even when you're so um, sort of vigilant, so heightened in your in your threat response, you can lean into that. Is there something you have, you give so much great advice in this book again? Any Anyone who hasn't read this book, go out, buy it, or go to the Carnegie Library and take it out. 
but it, it, there's so much great advice in here. What's the thing you tend to go to in that difficult moment that keeps you grounded or that keeps you in the conversation in a productive way? Yeah. Uh, I think honestly, it's, it's not a question so much as a, I think there's two things that I do. Um, but, but really they amount to the same thing, which is tell me more. Yeah. Say more yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, I, I can even, I can even admit, you know, I could say, man, that's hard for me to hear. Mm. You know, can you tell, can you tell me more though? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so that I'm not like got some pasted smile on my face that is right. disingenuous. <laughs> I, I have such an allergy to being disingenuous in a conversation. Yeah. I have to find some way to be honest. So yeah, but, but it's usually that is, is the tough moment might be because judgment is just really getting hot in my head. Right. And so maybe I need time. Maybe I need, I need them to, to tell a story. Maybe I, yeah. I need to sit, you know, in the conversation and consider alternatives to whatever right. horrible thing I'm yeah. imagining. Right. Cause, yeah. cause I talk about like, um, these three, these three particular untruths that we fall into when we're really off the cliff on judgment. This person is evil. This person is stupid. This person is mm. crazy. Mm. And there's a fourth one that's come up a lot. That's a little bit different. This person is wounded. Mm. But all four of those, what you're really saying is this person is worse than me. I am better mm. than this person. Mm. And when you are in that place, listening can't really happen because listening is ultimately about showing people they matter. Right. When a person feels heard, somebody is giving the gift of not just attention, but but a kind of elevation. You matter. You matter. Right. And I'm interested in you. Right. It's a beautiful right. thing. Right. So. Yeah, it's just, it's just, can we get more of that humanity in here so that I can remember all these things that are true, you know, oh, and, and, it. and forget the things that are wrong. Like right. you must be crazy, stupid, or evil. or wounded. Right, 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 right. Which, which uh, gets back to your, your conversation about there being sort of, uh, a mode of judgment or a mode of curiosity. And it's hard to stay curious when you're in the mode of uh, right. of judgment, of judgment right? It, it's, right it's the difference between the yeah but impulse right yes. which is the judgment i'm gonna and yes. the huh interesting as you right. say more Tell but me i more. should but i should say it's not like we can't judge and it's not like we can't challenge we should right. it's more right. about when you do it uh mm. so my my friend danny i talk about this in the book had a conversation with his father about vaccines this was earlier in the pandemic danny had been vaccinated his father really didn't want to and danny wanted to know why and obviously wanted to persuade, he wanted to persuade his father to change his mind. Yeah. So he he managed to ask a couple curious questions, but within minutes, the dad was like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And later Danny reflected on why, and he realized that he would ask a question. And then his dad would be like 20 seconds into an answer and Danny would interrupt with an opinion. All right. So you have to listen longer than you're, yeah. than you're comfortable with. You have to get more information so that your curiosity has somewhere to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you have to, it's not about not judging. It's about leaving judgment till after understanding has had some time. And right. then you can say, I see this very differently as you probably right. know. Yeah. Can I tell you what I mean? Can I tell you a particular thing that's in my head right now? And then you yeah. get that buy-in from the other person. That's a wonderful way to present your own different yeah. perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And your stories and all of my experiences say that that's actually a much better way to get to this place of wanting to help somebody shift or, right. or broaden or make their make their opinion more complex exactly. than me just driving for what it's I'm about the goal. To. Right. Like is, if your goal is to win, first of all, it's not yeah, you're going to be you're going to be uh, motivated to just jump in, jump in, interrupt, interrupt. But all that's going to happen, if you win, if you think you've won, it's because the other person just gave up. That doesn't right. mean you're right. It just means that person's exhausted or right. offended or they are hostile or yeah. you ended up in that place. That's not a win. Like in what book right. is that, right? So so really, if you want to be, if you want your perspective to be received, you have to take the time to receive their perspective just mm -hmm. as much. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. a complete, that's what it is. And right. so- that's extremely hard to do when we think we're just right and this person's nuts. It's right. really hard to do. But again, we come back to sort of John about the about the short bridges. You don't have to go right. to the biggest divide you can imagine. Um, you can start a lot smaller with people you already know and have some trust with, so that it's not quite so hard. So we're gonna we're move. There's a great segue into and and shortly we'll we'll go to the questions that people have been asking and asked uh, uh, Jessica to 
to let, you know, help us uh, look at some of the questions that people are asking online. Thank you so much for people who are engaging in this and for being here. This is um, exciting to have so many people, but but you're, you've sort of segued us into um, the the season that we're in, uh, we're quickly approaching the Thanksgiving season. Um, you know, uh, sometimes the bridges uh, that walk in our front door for Thanksgiving are very big bridges. Along uh, there are long divides there. Sometimes they're shorter. We have a joke around the office at Essential Partners that that we become Thanksgiving famous. I and mean, every year people want to know, what do we do around Thanksgiving? Right. What, what are your tips <laughs> for approaching family gatherings when you don't agree with your loved ones? Mm. Well, one thing is, you know, the right time and the right place. And yeah. is yeah. Thanksgiving the right time and the right place? <laughs> well, sometimes it's, it's the only opportunity, right? Because right. families right. live far apart. And I will yep. say that, hey, we are sorting ourselves geographically into more like-minded communities. So family ties can sometimes be a really great way to add friction. So mm -hmm. yes, it's a great opportunity, but pick your moment. If it's, right. if you're at the actual Thanksgiving table and your question, curiosity, you know, disagreement is with one person, do you really want that conversation to happen with so many witnesses where people have other priorities? They want to make sure this is a good conversation. Let's talk about the food. Let's connect. Is this the right time? Right. It, it might be good if, if it comes up, you can say, Hey, you know, Uncle Todd, I can we talk about this later? Like after dessert, I I really want to get into this with you. It might be fun, but I'm really curious about where we disagree here. So try to see if you can work on containment, um, which is a very important quality of conversation, the degree to which a conversation is contained to the people actually participating in it. Mm -hmm. When we have uh, debates on Facebook, bad idea most of the time. We're yeah. all thinking about the invisible listeners and we don't even know what they're thinking. And so it's like a panopticon effect or the Hawthorne effect, right? We're not exploring perspectives we're performing perspectives you don't want to perform perspectives at thanksgiving you may think you do you don't right. um so try not to score points if you care about these relationships try to actually get to know people the other thing is that you know sometimes one conversation isn't really enough for both parties mm -hmm. to feel curious for example mm -hmm. if there's baggage with a relative of yours where in the past maybe you've not been the most receptive you haven't really listened to them don't expect that they're going to suddenly be as curious with you as you want to be with them Mm -hmm. um, it may take a while for them to trust that you are really here to listen. You'll have mm -hmm. to demonstrate it over and over again for a bit. You'll be tempted to think this isn't working. You know, he's yeah. just talking at me. It's like the, the principle here is that people can only hear when they're heard and you can't control when they've reached that milestone. Mm -hmm. So it takes some patience yep. and, you know, and maybe sometimes you do have to give up, but hopefully you don't. Um, right. So yeah, I could go on and on. Oh, so good. That's so good. <laughs> but these are some some things. Yeah. If you want more, read the book. Yeah. Um, so okay, you you brought up Facebook, you brought up online. Um, I when when I'm out in the world leading trainings, uh, it's often the question that comes up, how do you do this online? What are ways or tips for for having more constructive conversations, you know, in the in the cyber world? Yeah. I mean, one thing to remember is that in the cyber world, most of the time we have a, a fraction of the full human toolbox of communication. And so the ways in which goodwill is communicated, for example, when we're in person with a little giggle or a smile, none of that appears. And so you have to go out of your way to translate all of those signals into words. Um, so that's why my mm -hmm. friend Angel Eduardo, who works at Fair Perspectives, says that social media is the boss level of discourse. It's mm -hmm. harder you know, and we, we like to think, no, it should be easier. You know, everything's simpler. I can just shoot out a little text. No, no, no. It is harder to have these conversations there. You can have them there, but it takes a lot of attention. And the problem with these platforms is attention isn't something that's guaranteed. If you're in person, you can tell by someone's body language, they're paying attention to you. You'll get kind of annoyed if they suddenly start looking at their phone in the middle of a tough topic. On social media, for all you know, that person is on the toilet. You don't know where that person is. <laughs> You know, like, you don't know, they could be like getting up and doing something else. 80% of their attention might be on a work meeting they're supposed to be on, on Zoom over here. You don't know. And so oftentimes what happens is we'll do things, we'll say things we regret or we'll be too reckless online mm -hmm. because our full attention isn't on the conversation. And then it starts to weigh on us and it's asynchronous. And when will that person respond? Oh my God, it's just a nightmare. <laughs> so right. it is, it is tough. And, and one other thing that makes, um, a lot of things better is remember that you don't, 
the conversation doesn't have to stay where it started. So mm. if there's a debate on Facebook, make it a direct message. Even, even that leap from uncontained to contained helps. Right. Or right. pick up the phone or ask if they can meet. I mean, it sounds tough, but if it's weighing on your mind and it's a pattern, you know, go talk to them about it. It'll help. Yeah, yeah. Interestingly that you say that, and I and I love that, uh, the the instance that I was talking about earlier with the pro-gun and um, oh, yeah. safety and, and yeah, the, the firearms in our country, that whole conversation, we did some training in person, then people went online, and then they got stuck in a place and then went back to being in person. They, oh, they reached out to each other and they wanted to connect and... Um, and right. and and mm -hmm. they actually it was on Zoom. It was before the pandemic, but it was on Zoom, and they got to see pictures of people, you know, photographs behind the person, and they were able to connect in a totally different way. Uh, and it and it uh, it shifted the relationship. So I love that advice. Yeah, the, it doesn't amazing. have to stay in the place yeah. uh, where it started. Reach out to the person. Yeah, I'm realizing now as you say that you go up a level to something where you have more of that communication toolbox and that's where yes. you can untangle the knots that have yes. unwittingly gotten all tangled yeah. on on a place where you just don't have enough tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a lot of questions that are coming up um, in our Q&A and Jess just, I think, popped up to help us navigate some of these. Um, I'm going to ask your support because there's a lot to read here. Absolutely. Yes, we've been keeping an eye and did our best to capture everything. Um, thank you both, first of all, so much. That was amazing. You packed a lot of great words in to mm -hmm. an hour. <laughs> uh, so this first one, um, you're both in different states. Um, so a lot of the folks tuning in, I think, are from across Pennsylvania, but probably even beyond Pennsylvania. But this question, um, do you have any suggestions for how to apply everything you touched on in rural communities? Mm. Well, um, yeah, I, I guess one assumption I'm making about that question is that it would be how to apply all that in rural communities when you yourself are not part of one or you're coming from an urban perspective. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah. I'll, I'll say quickly that there's a chapter in my book where I talk about Sherman County, Oregon, which is a rural county of 2000 people, heavily agriculture. And I helped organize uh, a trip after the 2016 election where people from Seattle and people from Sherman County were able to begin conversations across their differences. And one of the things that really struck me that I did not expect was how, how much of a shining and rare opportunity this was for the folks from Sherman County. Nobody from the city ever goes. Nobody, for any reason, it never happens. They go to the cities all the time. Nobody from the cities ever go to them. And so they, they almost felt like, this is my one chance. This is my one shot. What can I do to help people understand how I live? Oh my God, what do I do? We only have three hours. And I didn't, I didn't notice that until I talked to them later and I realized, oh my gosh, they were... <laughs> They were kind of, a couple of them were really agonizing over that. This is our one chance to be seen from people by people in the city who, in our view, have so much power, right? Um, and so there's that, is, is that this particular divide is a really hairy one. There's a lot of um, debates about what happens, you know, across these divides. But I think that the main thing is spend, spend some time asking people to share the story of their lifestyle and how it appears to contrast or how it appears to be different from what is assumed. There's so many stereotypes out there about this lifestyle. It's, I mean, to what John brought up before, so much condescension applied. So that's, you know, beyond the one-on-one -on -one that you might be having where you're trying to hear each other, a person from a rural community may have this huge weight on top of them of how it feels that mainstream society doesn't hear them. And so that's a lot to try to unpack and try to lift off of their shoulders. And I think the way to do that is make sure that people who come up together across these completely different lifestyles get a chance to describe that for each other um, and try to explore that with each other before they even get to, you know, these political disagreements that might have something to do with those different lifestyles. 
I love that. It's, uh, and I do think that the urban rural divide is one of the most tricky, difficult conversations in our country. And I, uh, I love working on them. But I also hear in the question, maybe the possibility that there's within a rural community, and I think that the cost of polarization in a rural community is even more painful because people are so reliant on each other uh, for goods and services and, and um, you know, to see each other. It's hard to, you know, in a, in a city, I can keep with my people, whoever that group is, and I can get most of my needs met within that. In a rural community, you have to have a lot of natural bridging. Mm -hmm. And I actually think right. that uh, this can be some of the most powerful work in those, com in those communities. I have learned through my studies overseas and places like Lebanon and others that uh, having traditions and having um, sort of customs and uh, things that people lean into on a yearly basis, like everybody coming out and doing work for the, you know, for the harvest festival or the, you know, the fair that people put on, having other activities that continue to draw us towards each other and yeah. remind us that we rely on each other are really important for helping to yeah. build enough you know, trust to stay in community together. That's great. Thank you both. All right, this next one is, what tips do you have for encouraging the appreciation of both nuance and individual human dignity in our conversations and relationships? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nuance is, is endangered. Um, one, one big thing that makes a, a big impact is when you share your opinion in a conversation, to do it in a language that, that, that gets across that there's flexibility and openness. So instead of, you know, yeah, th this is how it is, or even I think this is how it is, you could say, right now as I think about it, this is how it feels to me. And so each of those gives openness. So this is how I feel about it and how it feels to me. It's much easier for someone to feel like they could present their honest opinion, even if it's contradictory to that one. And that way you can start to explore the nuance of it. Um, presenting your opinion with nuance is also great. <laughs> you know, getting beyond and behind talking points. So I, I talk about using talking points talking points as starting points. So if there is a slogan or a meme you saw online that you think, man, that really captures it, instead of just repeating it and having that be what you say, you can say, you know, there's this, there's this, there's the slogan, this is it, here's why I like it, here's what I see in it that seems really valuable to me. Um, what do you think about it? Or what concerns you about it? Uh, ending your opinions, statements with questions is also great because you're you're reaching out a hand to that person, making sure you're not monologuing too much. And you're checking in on, is this still making sense? Are we connecting? Anytime that you can find a point to say, that's a good point. Oh, that's fair. I never thought of it that way. Uh, whatever those happen to be, those are incredible check-in moments. And it's almost like a reset, you know? Oh yeah, yeah, cool. We're still here, we're still in it. And now we can maybe move to something a little harder. And so that's another way you can climb toward nuance. Yep. The genuine, honest question that you've written so much about in this book, I think, invites nuance and helps people feel uh, like they're being provided dignity. And I think that there's really no greater gift than, than curiosity about what somebody really cares about. And um, it, it, that's part of what I think people leave a good dialogue feeling if it, if it goes well is yeah. this sense of being better known both to self and other. And that feels like dignity. Yeah. I'll say also real quick. Uh, yeah. Th this reminded me of it, but I, I wonder if, you know, folks here listening have had the experience where you're talking with someone and then they're asking you a question about you that you didn't expect that they would ask. And you're like, it, it feels really good you know it feels really good when someone takes an interest in you beyond where you thought was was relevant or necessary it is it's a gift so so curiosity is a form of caring um which is is something i didn't realize until after the book was published I'm like yeah it really is isn't it it's it's a really beautiful thing that we give each other our attention and our interest absolutely 
<clears throat> okay, so what if someone is unfortunately hardline, they just refuse to change? How do you listen and not escalate a situation? We can be against racism and looting of businesses, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, refuses to change is an interesting phrase. It, it goes to show that sometimes we do come into conversations maybe with the expectation that they ought to change in the course of conversation. And so I get curious about that. Uh, where does the expectation come from that this person should change? Should change into what? Uh, based on what? Um, that's that's a tricky one. So yeah, can you come into a conversation curiously if the goal is for the other person to change? Now, we all want to persuade and that's okay. Um, putting curiosity first, listening longer helps persuasion be actually impactful and effective. So um, if the question is about, we've spent time, I've spent time in sort of this curious frame and this person is just repeating everything. They don't seem to have any openness to much of anything even if I've asked them where things come from for them, even if I've asked them about concerns and made observations. I mean, it kind of comes down to the uncomfortable truth that we we can't control anyone else. We just can't. And we don't know what's holding them to their beliefs with so much certainty. We can try modeling curiosity. Curiosity is contagious. It absolutely yeah. spreads, but you can't guarantee it. And there absolutely will be people who, for whatever reason, they feel that I'm not budging. I'm not moving. This is this is it. Um, and there's, it, I would say that even with those people, it doesn't mean it's impossible for there to be flexibility, but it might take a really, really long time. Or there might be something in your relationship that makes it particularly tough. What do you think, John? Because that's a tough one. No, I, 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 I love that you brought it back to time. I mean, you know, uh, it's it's like your story about driving and recognizing, realizing that you hadn't examined something. Somebody had planted a seed for you, and it grew. And um, and as you said, so many of the beliefs and opinions have that people have, they've come to over a long time. They've all of these things that they've been through, all of the experiences that they've that they've had have you know really deepened a strong belief for them at this point that's hard to uproot in a conversation uh it it it's going to take time for people to examine to be willing to step back and so um the less threat there is in the room right. the less sense that you're trying to convince them of something the more space perhaps they have to actually be introspective and to explore and uh it might not pay off in that conversation or in that year but i have seen it pay off and i have seen people uh, come back after a year or two years and say you know i'm still thinking about that dialogue we had um, it still is, uh, it, it sort of still means something to me. And I think that's the best we can do sometimes. That's right. You could, you could be having influence without knowing it. Right. Okay. Uh, this sounds like it might touch on, uh, Monica's family situation, perhaps. Uh, what if your spouse watches Fox news and believes Biden did not win the election? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I I have questions back, you know. So what what if meaning, what's the goal, right? Your spouse, okay. <laughs> so I know um, uh, there's two leaders at Brave Angels, Barbara and Rick, who are married, and she's Democrat, he's Republican, he voted for Trump. Um, there were days in their marriage they talked about this on a podcast where they could not talk to each other, but they realized that they could write letters to each other. So there were days where they just wrote letters near the near the 2020 election. This is how it feels. This is what's going on but it was just too much. So they found they found a way to turn toward each other. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with the Gottman Institute. The Gottman Institute is fantastic about relationships and they talk about that, the importance of you can turn toward each other, you can turn away from each other, um, or you can kind of just uh, just actually oppose, like, like fight each other. And so- yeah, Turn against, yeah. Turn against, yeah. So if there's, I don't know, it, can you- can you ask some questions? Can you, you know, if you disagree here and you think there's something bad going on, what is the what is the moment you could find time to talk about it? But again, you're in relationship, so what is the goal anyway? What what would be the goal? And can you be honest with yourself and with your spouse? What is the goal? Is is it understanding? Is it trying to change his behavior? 
you know, where is that in the realm of a relationship is is a very personal thing. But again, I, I John, what do you think about this one? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I it comes up a lot in the conversation around facts and around, um, you know, uh, well, no, that's not true because of all of these facts. And people think that if we just had the facts, that would save us. Yeah. Um, it's often not the case. So then the conversation, I think, can be two things. One, and all, of course, all the things you said, but I think it can be why are those facts compelling to you? Why yeah. do, do those facts make sense to you? And why do you believe that source? Um, so you can talk about the reasons that you believe or don't believe certain sources. I think the other is that you could together um, seek sources that you could both trust. When, you know, Where is there a third opinion? And this is very traditional conflict resolution work where is there a third opinion that we could both trust that we could both look to as sort of an outside mm. source uh, i don't believe that journalist you don't believe this journalist who is it that we both trust is there some source yeah. out there and what are they telling us about their perspective so that's yeah. just another and there's probably you know a moment if, if it hasn't already happened of you're, you're probably tempted to want to have the conversation where you can say i'm concerned i'm concerned that <laughs> that this is happening and that, you know, that this is the way it could be bad or harmful. Yeah. Um, and that's tricky. And hopefully that conversation happens in a place where it can really be heard and can lead to something like what John is saying, you know, can we, can we have a conversation that we can share and yeah, <laughs> and get there bit by bit, but I'll, but I'll go back to something I said earlier too. You know, there's even when they're there, when we don't believe there's any truth in people's conclusions, there's truth in our stories. There's a bedrock of our relationship. There's, there's the dignity and the hum, humanity and there's validity, you know, to, to everybody, um, even with something like this that's torn us apart at the seams. Um, so that's where we begin, you know, the goal of we all want a good society, we all want elections that work and elections that can be trusted. So help me understand what's affecting that trust, because I want a society where everybody trusts elections. That's the dream. <laughs> all right. <laughs> How do you go about listening to stories that are based on things like racism, sexism, especially when it comes to something that you identify with? Yeah, this is one where I would I would ask for an example. Like, what do you mean a story? So, can you repeat the question? A story that's based on racism? Yeah. How do you go about listening to stories that are based on racism, sexism, et cetera, especially when it comes to something that you identify with? Mm, like, right, where it's your identity. <clears throat> well, I have a couple of friends who have children who are trans, and they are not about to put themselves in conversation with folks who have, you know, serious, like, reservations or judgments of, of the trans identity and lifestyle, and I would never ask them to, right? So, so for each of us, there's I don't know about each of us, but for, for many of us, there are there are red lines because this is who we are. And if I have a conversation with someone who thinks I'm wrong, <laughs> it's gonna be really tough. You know, we talked about condescension, uh, a conversation where one person thinks that they're better than the other is is just not gonna be a very good conversation. So if that's what we, but then we have to get curious. Are we assuming that this person believes that about us? Because I think that happens very easily these days with such a high threat level. Sometimes it might be really clear. Other times it really might not be. And we should be careful. We should just be careful to make sure that we're not fighting a ghost, seeing a monster that may not be there. There might be some other thing going on here. Um, the other day, this is a little, little relevant, but <clears throat> the other day I had a conversation with um, a man who's much older and um, he was paying me a compliment by saying, um, you know, it's always so impressive to me. And he did this in front of a big group of people when, when a woman can articulate herself so well. And so that was one where, uh, you know, it kind of hit me a little bit like, and then, and then I, I tried to remember this man has spent most of his life in a very different world when it came to gender roles. Can I have any empathy for that? Um, you know, can I understand the intention? So obviously this gets to a lot of big debates about intent versus impact and things like that. But at the end of the day, this is a personal decision. And if there's some divides that are just too hot to handle, there are others that are not. And you can still be curious about other things, work on those short bridges. Um, but hopefully, and hopefully those help turn down the temperature, right? So that, and I love this quote, um, uh, don't waste your fears on anything but danger. 
So the, the more sharply we can tell where the real danger is, right, and where we don't see it in more places than we ought to be, the more the more sanely we'll walk through the world, <laughs> hopefully more creatively. So it's this, this is a very personal decision for, for everyone to make on their own. It's really important to say, uh, for those of us, especially who are advocating for people having these deep and difficult conversations, to say it is never an expectation that any individual take on a conversation that doesn't feel safe to them, right? Or that doesn't feel like it's in their best interest. It has to be within your purpose and, you know, uh, and your sense of what you can do. And that can be different at different times in your life. You know, yeah. um, there are times when I can have that conversation and I can't. Sometimes you're sort of exhausted by having it over and over again. Um, and and that's entirely understandable. Uh, and uh, I think that the the, uh, the only thing I would say, too, is that lots of people in that situation do find it in their best interest to have some of those conversations because they want to be known more mm -hmm. fully. They want somebody to understand that they have, you know, experiences that are real and nuanced and, um, and don't want to be seen as some boogeyman other to the person that they're talking to. Uh, so it sometimes can be empowering and sometimes too dangerous for somebody or, or feel that way and we just have to honor that that's the case for them okay i know we have our final few minutes so we'll wrap up here um to make the personal changes in perspective and to learn to question and be curious rather than judge seems to require a good bit of work. I have a lot of doubt that enough people will be willing to do the homework required to make any significant change. Any ideas on what we might be able to do to prompt others to make something like this more of a priority and worth the work in their lives? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, modeling. I know it seems small, but this this does not scale easily. This actually is small. That's where the power is, where people experience this is, is at that scale. Um, but the impact can be broader than you think. We have at Braver Angels, our most famous workshop is the Red Blue Workshop. It's been studied by Brown University to have depolarizing effects weeks and months later. And in that workshop, one of the big takeaways that people always announce at the end is, I mean, I had no idea that people on the other side were were humble like this, could think like this, could, you know, could could walk through their opinions like this. And then they take that away into every other time that they encounter someone on the other side. They remember, they remember what they saw in that workshop and they go, well, maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe this isn't as certain or as bad as I think it is. And maybe these people, if I if I approached them, I would learn a lot from them as well. So it's it's it is an experience that gets sort of ported out. Um, but the other thing that I'll say is that, you know, in case we assume that we all have to become Zen masters of this stuff, I, I, I say in the book, and I really believe that even if we all become just one unit more curious than we already are, and that could be anything from the next time you encounter a headline that represents a perspective that is opposed to your own, but you know, is popularly held and you click on that headline instead of just hating it. You click on it and you read it and you ask yourself, what's the deep down honest concern that's behind this opinion? No matter how much anger is there, what is the concern? You're already practicing curiosity. You're already building that muscle. So these steps don't have to be hard work. They don't even require an actual conversation with another person. Um, you can approach more curiously a lot of things. But you know, to your point about, well, I don't know if enough people will do this. I kind of look at it all as it has to be in balance. So you know, the people at the holding up the signs, the slogans, the activists at the center of communities of belief, they change the world. We need fighters, you know? We need the fighters who are not gonna spend a lot of time moderating or mediating, they're here. But they need people at the boundaries of the communities of belief, making sure that that boundary is porous, reaching out a hand, right? So in other words, it all has to be in balance. Right now I'm concerned that there's not enough of us reaching out a hand, but there may not need to be that many. Right. Um, so, so I, yeah, I, I come, back, I come at this very optimistic. I happen to be sitting on the front row of a lot of initiatives that are going to make a big difference on this. And I think as people experience the positive effects, it's going to spread more and more. So can I guarantee that? No, 
but I think the, the best you can do is to model it and, and, and model it in your own life in the conversations you have and, and people will see that it makes a difference. Yeah, I think that when people experience being heard in a deep way, it's powerful and moving and they want more of it. Yeah. Right? It is. It has this kind of sense of um, uh, a connection is uh, what we human beings desire connection with each other, don't want to be alienated from each other. So when they have the experience. So I think part of what Essential Partners is trying to do is to train people to make the spaces where people get together more connective, right? It, so that where people join, whether it's in faith communities or at the library or, uh, you know, in, in, a, in some civic uh, space or in schools, create spaces where there is an opportunity for people to ask each other genuinely curious questions, people to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you've got to go on and put on a lot of dialogues. We're already getting together in places all across our country to talk about important things. Part of our work, I think, and people can get, get, get trained to do this, you can go to our website and take a training. It, it is to transform the spaces where we meet into dialogic spaces, into curious spaces, rather than having a pro mic and a con mic at every gathering when you're trying to decide something, which means you're getting pro and con and divisive conversation, get into circles and talk and tell stories and ask each other questions, transform the spaces where we meet into places of curiosity. And can I just say, I am going to promote you both so good right now. I have taken both the red and the blue workshop in Braver Angels. Highly recommend it if you are open-minded even a little bit. It's so useful to hear and be in conversation with both sides. And I have taken the Essential Partners Facilitator training several times, also incredibly worthwhile. We put both links in the chat. Thank you both so, so much for being here and sharing your time and experiences. I know we're like a minute over, but I just can't, share my appreciation enough. Um, I feel like our attendees feel the same way. Um, thanks once more to the Pittsburgh Foundation for supporting the work of Civic CLP through generous funding. And finally, we're going to share in the chat um, a follow-up as well as in the follow-up email, a book list related to this event. Should you be interested in reading more about these topics? Thank you again. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, John and Monica. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure to talk to you, Monica. Thanks, John.